Bonjour and welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast, infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture to spice up your relationship with God. Here is your host, Stéphanie Roussel. Before we get started today, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we are in our brand new series, Jesus, Rabbi, and Lord. And I simply could not be more thrilled to do this series with you. We have amazing workbooks for each and every single episode. We have a summary, a listening guide, some key takeaways, the key quotes, some Bible verses to go with it, up to 10 questions per episode to allow you to use in your quiet time to go deeper. And then even topics for further research in case something really just tickles your interest. So these workbooks are honestly a complete steal. They're super cheap. They're absolutely gorgeous. You really want them to enhance your experience of our series, Jesus, Rabbi, and Lord. Go to gospelspice.com slash Jesus in order to purchase them. And now our episode. I remember visiting my grandmother's attic a very long time ago. There, I found a box of dried lavender. As I opened it, the scent enveloped me instantly and I was whisked back to the south of France. Lavender sachets and antique bedrooms dressers. Lavender fields buzzing with golden bees. Lavender embroidered linen napkins at the dinner table. Lavender is the quintessence of French living. That's what my American friends tell me. It feels both comfortably old world and surprisingly modern. Lavender is actually not used in French cooking, much to my American friend's dismay. My grandma would have never conceived of adding the little flower to her quiche or her salad. To us French, lavender is ingested for medicinal purposes in very small homeopathic doses. It settles an upset stomach or an overactive mind. Did you know that ingesting large quantities of lavender can be lethal? The truth of the matter is, I don't actually really like lavender. I love its shape and color, but I'm not a big fan of its scent and flavor. I like the idea that lavender seems to promise this serendipitous world unfurling from its soothing, delicate hues. But I simply don't care for its sharp trademark scent. I have tasted lavender-flavored coffee so overpowering I had to spit it out. And I am lethally allergic to bees who love lavender. The way I see it, misapplied lavender usually overpromises and underdelivers. Just like today's overrated idea of independence. Case in point, my atheist family of origin thrives on a fierce spirit of independence. Being in control. Being strong. Not needing anyone. And especially not needing God. A quest to seek independence from God leaves a lavender-scented trail. It tricks and deceives with a false promise, only to leave you empty-handed. So my friends, if you love lavender, please forgive me and don't take it personally, but join me on this journey today as we look at the spiritual consequences of misapplied lavender. The attic dwelling box of dried lavender contained another treasure, old family photo albums. Within their pages, a photo of my grand aunt who seems to be posing with a vengeance, a fierce spirit of independence etched across her face. That's when it struck me. I look exactly like her. The yellowed frown honestly isn't flattering to say the least, but the resemblance is striking. The faint echo of lavender lingers on her sepia likeness. It's a perfect pairing. The faint echo of independence lingers in my family. It's good, it's bad, and it's ugly. What else have I inherited from my ancestors? And then the kicker. What traits have I passed down to my kids? Are you wondering the same things? What have you inherited from your ancestors? What are you passing down to the next generation? 
whether they are your biological descendants or your spiritual ones. I pulled out the modern, glossy, online-born photo albums with the orange logo, and I browsed. Yep, that stubborn spirit of independence is there, right? Among other things. The good, the bad, and the ugly. That's family. Lavender-scented independence and all. You see, the Old Testament is a lavender-scented family photo album in much the same ways. We see faces and stories. We see the good and the bad. We get a good glimpse at our family's inherited ancestry traits. So let's open that book together. As we open the family album of the Old Testament and its prophecies, one of the first assertions we can safely make is that we struggle with the same lavender-scented sins that they did. Lavender fields covered the Old Testament landscape as much as they do ours today. The problem with sin is that it's so tempting. Just take a look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. If I take Jesus' interpretation of them in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthews 5-7, to I have broken every single one. And so have all of our Old Testament spiritual ancestors. And if you're honest, probably you too. Just one quick example. Jesus says that committing murder is a no-no under Exodus 20.13 for obvious reasons. Well, Jesus takes it a step further and he says that committing murder is the same as being angry against someone. Or it's the same as uttering any sort of name-calling. That's in Matthew 5, verses 21 to 26. And with that, I just raised my case. We have broken every single one of the Ten Commandments, even the ones that seem the hardest to break, like committing murder. Our natural tendency is to think we're good enough people. The human heart is wired that way. This malfunction is one of the many consequences of sin. It's genetically passed down to us like a lingering lavender scent. Deep down, most of us naturally think that if we try hard enough, it's going to be good enough. The particulars are irrelevant, whether it's pleasing our parents, climbing the career or social ladder, getting that bigger house or that perfect physique. And the stakes are irrelevant too, whether the standard is high, such as purity in marriage or raising children, for example, or whether the standard is seemingly low. How bad is a white lie, really? One of two things happen when we try hard to measure up to a standard. We think we fail, or we think we succeed. Either way, we're doomed. If we failed, or if we merely think we failed, this will inexorably trigger shame, fear of consequences, and guilt. If, on the other hand, we feel we're succeeding at meeting our lofty standard, then pride is likely to take up residence in our hearts. Especially when we look around and we start comparing ourselves to others. Oh, I got this. Or, I'm hopeless. It's so tempting, and either way, it's deadly. Our 21st century Western culture is the most narcissistic, egocentric, self-centered culture to have ever sprouted out of the human heart. It's all about me, me, me. Our lavender-laced culture is the embodiment of self-ism. It started in the 1960s and 70s, where those hyphenated words with self started sprouting all over. Self-esteem, self-worth, self-glory, self, self, self. Me, me, me. The lavender-hued family album of the Bible paints a different picture. Feelings of failure or success are not the measuring stick. What God says is. And he says that murder and anger and name-calling and adultery and white lies are all poison in our cup. Whether our glass of water contains one single drop of poison or a cup full of it, it would be unwise to drink it. It is deadly. You see, the initial sin in the Garden of Eden was deadly because Adam and Eve were basically trying to find a way to have a relationship with God on their own terms, not his. They wanted a relationship with God only when it was convenient. 
God had told them what was good and bad for them, out of love and care for them, in absolute truth. He knew what would poison them. Only this one specific fruit in an orchard of limitless choices. There was one tree in a million that was forbidden. I wonder if the scent of lavender is what attracted them to this fruit. Adam and Eve wanted their way, their terms, their condition. They wanted independence from God, so they wiped the fruit clean. Ingesting large amounts of lavender is lethal. In this case, actually, the first bite was enough to cause separation because there's no such thing as just a smidge of sin. One single drop of poison is lethal. You see, independence from God is never a good idea because God embodies all that is good and lovely and beautiful and perfect and trustworthy. So, independence from Him means detachment from those things too. Wanting your way when it is the opposite of God's way is wanting the opposite of everything that God represents and all of His qualities. And so you ultimately get bad and ugly and evil and twisted and untrustworthy. That's what we choose whether we realize it or not every time we choose our way over God's way. Temptation is laced with lavender. We so casually believe that we can rule our life better than God can. And we think we can get away with it too. How tempting. So what does God say about sin and good deeds? What does the Bible say about living life the way God intended? I was asking a dear friend recently. She was raised in a nominally Christian home and she's never read her Bible. She assumed that the Bible taught the value of being a good person and of doing good deeds. No, the Bible does not teach that good deeds get you to heaven. And she was shocked to discover that. That's what world religions teach us, that good people go to heaven. That is a lavender-scented minefield. That's independence from God. It's saying, I can do this on my own. God never said that being good enough is good enough. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount hammers the last nail on the coffin of this unbiblical concept. We all believe that we are good enough until we meet him there at the cross where he is nailed for us. Let me ask you a question, my friend. I'm going to ask it to you twice because I really want you to ponder this. Why would Jesus die on the cross if being good enough is good enough? Think about this. Let me ask you again. Please ponder this. Why would Jesus die on the cross if being good enough is good enough. Hmm. You see, God does not grade on a curve. Your university professor probably did grade on a curve. Maybe your boss indirectly grades on a curve. Maybe you unconsciously grade your own kids on a curve. Do you grade yourself on a curve? It's tempting, you have to admit. Have you ever compared yourself to someone else before deciding whether you deserve a passing grade? I don't care whether it's for your looks, or your house, or your jobs, or your kids, or your whatever. We all grade others and ourselves on a curve, whether we realize it or not. We compare. Based on our natural inclinations, we are either more critical on others or on ourselves. Either way, it's not God's way. God does not grade on a curve. Being good enough is not good enough. So let's explore this for a moment. What if God actually graded on a curve? What if God had said that good enough is good enough? Hmm. If God did grade on a curve, what would be the cutoff? You tell me. Because you see, good enough, that's not precise enough. If we are founding our entire eternity strategy on being good enough, quote unquote, so then we'd better define what we mean by that. And precisely too. So let's get to it. What is good enough? Is that a percentage of the population, for example? Is it a number of people? Let's say the top 50% or the first 10 billion people? 
whatever the unit of measure, there's a cutoff point, whether it's 50% or 80% or 99%. Let's say it's 50% for the sake of the argument. If the cutoff is 50%, what about the person who is at 49.9? Is it fair for her that she missed entry to heaven by a fraction of a point, especially if someone made it by the skin of their teeth at 50.1%? And how about the one who is at 49.99% or 49.99999%? You get my point. A cutoff is not fair, whether it's 1% or 50% or 99%. And you see, God is fair, perfectly just and fair. So what's he to do? If we were God's advisor on this, as we so aptly promote ourselves. What would we recommend? Well, I think there's two options, really. Either we all make it, or none of us makes it, because as we just saw, a cutoff is not fair. So let's say we all make it. That means that 100% of the humans make it to heaven. Somehow, accepting 100% of the people rubs me the wrong way. Do you remember the guy who just cut you off on the interstate yesterday? Does he deserve heaven? He almost caused an accident. And if you're honest, you might have rewarded him with a few chosen words. Based on what Jesus said about calling someone stupid, do you deserve heaven, Uma? If our hearts cry out for justice, for such a small injustice as being cut off on the interstate, what about Hitler and Stalin? And Mao, if we accept 100% of the people, we accept them too. Closer to home, what about the pedophile, the rapist, the mass murderer, the sex trafficker? Do they go to heaven if we take 100%? If you've been hurt or worse, if your loved one has been hurt, your heart needs justice to start healing. God agrees with you. Justice is necessary. Not everyone can be accepted because our actions and our words matter. We all instinctively know that. Seeking and restoring forgiveness matters. What makes Hitler or the sex trafficker intolerable is their callousness, the total absence of empathy, the utter lack of a desire to acknowledge the hurt that they cause, along with a desire to change. So no, not 100% of the people can make it to heaven. Some people simply do not deserve heaven. So, because there's no cutoff, because that's not fair, then the alternative is that no one makes it. Ouch. Do you see another option? Because I don't. No one makes it to heaven. That's actually what the Bible teaches. All have fallen short of the standard. That's a paraphrase of Romans 3.23. Everyone in the family photo album of the Old Testament, everyone in humankind in general, everyone has fallen short of the standard, and you and me. Because it's the only just and fair option, deep down, we know. We've all hurt someone else, even if we didn't mean to. If you entrust me with your car, for example, I will be honored. But if I accidentally wreck it, I'll be ashamed. Whether you forgive me or not, a price will have to be paid at the auto body shop. Either I will pay the bill, or you will. The insurance might, but your premium is going to increase. Or you can choose to take the bus from now on. Either way, when something is broken, a price has to be paid to restore it. Especially in relationships. That is why forgiveness is so costly. But there's hope. So far, we've taken a pretty grim look at the lavender-scented family album. We share the same sins, and we share the same judgment as our spiritual Old Testament ancestors. Stick with me here. It's looking up from here because we also share the same hope. The Old Testament is chock full of commandments and rules and regulations, and the clear teaching that we simply cannot live up to that standard. The temptation to cave in is just too strong. But the Old Testament is even more replete with hope of restoration, rest from God and a secure future. 
One of my favorite examples is Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you hope and a future. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search me with all of your heart. You see verse 11, the first half, has become a Christian home trademark these days. I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope in a future. But did you hear verse 13? Let me read it to you again. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. This is the Lord's declaration. God's heart is not bent to punish. God is bent on giving love. He wants a personal relationship with you and he tells you exactly how to get it. All we need to do is seek him. Remember, he gets to dictate the rules because he knows better. Just like a perfect, loving parent to a little child. And so God came up with a plan of salvation. Honestly, only he could dream up such a crazy plan. Being perfectly fair and just, he knew that no cutoff was the only acceptable option. Being perfectly loving, he knew that we needed a solution stronger than our temptation. And what a solution he gives us. It features the most important element we have in common with our Old Testament family album. We share the same Savior. Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, is Savior to both Jews and non-Jews or Gentiles. You see, God is outside of time. For the Old Testament believers, God could look forward to the event of the cross and resurrection and apply Jesus' righteousness to them. For us, He can look back in time to that same event of the cross and resurrection and offer it to us the same gift. He can give us righteousness in Christ because it's consistent with His character, His perfect justice and His perfect love. Unlike God, we are bound in time and space. Our Old Testament spiritual ancestors looked forward in time to see Messiah. We look back to both the Old and the New Testaments. While we certainly do not need to understand the Old Testament to accept Jesus' gift of life, it provides a powerful background to the grace offered when temptation is irresistible. And Jesus offers hope that is even more irresistible. Next week on Gospel Spice Podcast, we will take a deep plunge into the temptation that Jesus faced. I hope you will join us as we dive deep into the hope through the episode of The Temptation of Jesus. As you know, Gospel Spice exists to inspire our generation to delight in God. We do this through this podcast right here, but also online Bible studies, leadership trainings, and we want to serve you as a Christ follower because you seek to live a life spiced with the gospel. We want to love God because He first loved us, and we want to experience the fullness of life with Him and not be content with stale, boring, leftover faith. Jesus tells us that the most important thing is to love the Lord our God. So we take Jesus seriously. And then he adds that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now there's many ways to do that, but I've always felt personally a deep compassion for victims of human trafficking. It's modern day slavery and it revolts the heart of God. So they are our particular neighbors here at Gospel Spice. We want to play our part in raising awareness and then financially supporting those who fight this great evil. Now we I'd like to invite you to join our team in one of three ways. First, to pray Gospel Spice Forward. Pray for our guests, our listeners, our participants. Pray for our partners against human trafficking. Then two, play Gospel Spice Forward by telling your friends about us and by please leaving positive reviews and comments on your podcast listening apps. And then by sharing about us on social media. And then third, by paying Gospel Spice Forward. Did you know that less than 1% of our listeners are supporting us financially, we really need your help. 
please consider paying Gospel Spice Forward today. It can be a one-time donation or a monthly one for the amount of your choice. Your donation is fully tax deductible here in the United States. And plus, once we cover our costs, the biggest possible significant portion of your donation is going to be given back to Christian organizations that fight human trafficking. We vet them thoroughly so you could know that every dime you give us is used for the kingdom of God. Every little bit helps. So be part of the spice of the gospel by becoming a partner with us today. Pray for us, play Gospel Spice, and pay Gospel Spice forward. Merci.